The first quarter of an MLB season is a lot more interesting than people give it credit for because we're starting to get a little bit of an idea of how good each team actually is, but there's still so much time for things to change. For example, on May 15th of last season, the Colorado Rockies were 17 and 17, while the Atlanta Braves were 16 and 19. The Rockies finished in last in the NL West at 68 and 94, while the Braves finished first in the NL East at 101 and 61. So it's important for fan bases to not get their hopes up or overreact and claim the season is over this time of year. Looking at the standings now, about half the league is within five games of 500, with a lot of baseball left to play to sort everything out. But that doesn't change the fact that teams do have expectations, and if these expectations aren't met in a timely manner, things can turn ugly for a franchise pretty fast. I'm not going to keep picking on the White Sox, I know they were last week's video, but they were the perfect example in 2022 of a team that had high expectations, and after a rough start, everyone kept saying they have time. And then before you know it, the season is over and you miss the postseason. In 2023, that would be the nightmare scenario for the New York Mets. In this video, I'm going to explain why the next four and a half months of baseball for the Mets are maybe the most important stretch of games they'll ever have, and how the rest of this season will make or break the future of their franchise. Before I get into it, welcome to The War Room, a channel where I discuss all things sports related. I'm going to be making MLB content like this all season long, so subscribe to the channel if you're new, and let's get straight to it. First, we have to break down how the Mets put themselves in this position, and why expectations for them were through the roof heading into the year. Going all the way back to 2015, where the Mets won the NL East, putting them in the postseason for the first time since 2006. They beat the favored Dodgers in the NLDS and swept the wildcard winning Cubs in the NLCS to make their first World Series since 2000, but they ended up losing to the Royals in five games. While the Mets were talented this year, they overachieved, and it was surprising they made it as far as they did. But if you're a few games away from winning a World Series when it's your first time in the postseason in almost a decade, many people will consider that a successful season. But unfortunately for Mets fans, this was a success that the franchise never came close to repeating. In 2016, they were slightly worse in the regular season and got bounced in the NL wildcard game. Then they pretty much just became the same old Mets everyone was used to seeing prior to their 2015 fluke. It was clear that if a franchise wanted to field a talented team that actually gave them a real shot at contention year after year, Something needed to change, and all signs pointed to the front office. Following the Mets' 1986 World Series win, they were owned by the Wilpon family, who were despised by fans after they failed to put a winning team on the field as the decades went on. In 2017, fans only had to put up with them for a little bit longer, while in the meantime, they saw some young talent start to thrive. That year, Mets' 2011 first-round pick Brandon Nimmo began his first official rookie season, and he's been a solid piece for the team since then. The next year, in 2018, the Mets called up future All-Star and batting champion Jeff McNeil. 2018 was also the year that Jacob DeGrom won his first of back-to-back -back Cy Young Awards with the Mets, then during that offseason, the Mariners traded closer Edwin Diaz to New York. The next season, it was Pete Alonso's turn. Alonso became an all-star, won Rookie of the Year, and broke Aaron Judge's rookie home run record after hitting 53. So even though the team still wasn't making the postseason, the Mets had real potential to be dangerous in the near future. Fast forward to 2020, as the Mets were in the middle of the COVID season, the fans got the news they'd been waiting for. Billionaire hedge fund manager and lifelong Mets fan Steve Cohen bought the team from the Wilpons and now owns about 90 7% of the franchise. The Mets now have the richest owner by far in the entire league, who made it a point that he does not care how much money he needs to spend as long as it means winning baseball. A few months later, the Mets made one of the biggest acquisitions in franchise history when they landed four-time All-Star shortstop Francisco Lindor from the Cleveland Indians. Overall, 2021 still was not a great year for the team, so Cohen decided to try even harder. During the 2021 offseason, Billy Epler was hired as the new general manager of the Mets. Less than two weeks later, they signed three-time Cy Young winner, eight-time All-Star, and future Hall of Fame pitcher Max Scherzer to a three-year $130 million contract, and All-Star outfielder Starling Marte to a four-year deal worth $78 million. The amount of star power the Mets were getting from these signings is something that would have taken the Wilpons two decades to do, and it only took Steve Cohen two years. With Alonzo, McNeil, Nimmo, Marte, and Lindor as the core of this lineup, DeGrom and Scherzer as the best one-two punch in baseball, and Edwin Diaz as the team's closer, it was time for the 2022 season. From the very beginning, this looked like it was the year fans expected to have once Cohen took over. Everything was going the Mets' way. They were completely dominating the NL East, and on July 1st, they had a 10.5 game lead over the second place Atlanta Braves. It was clear this team was going to make the postseason, the question was how far could they go. But there was one problem. Remember at the beginning of the video when I talked about how the Braves had a bad start and then they finished with a great record? 
Yeah, that's what happened. After Atlanta started the year 23 and 27, they went 78 and 34 over the final 112 games and finished the year with the exact same record as the Mets at 101 and 61. But because Atlanta had a better head to head record versus the Mets, they were the NL East division champs while the Mets would have to settle for the wild card. During the 2022 season, the Mets were tied or leading the NL East in all but two of their first 157 games of the season. And right before the season was about to end, the Braves snuck in to win it because of their insanely hot stretch. So despite winning 101 games and getting back to the postseason for the first time since 2016, it was bittersweet because the team let the division title slip away. The worst part is had the Mets won the division, they would have gotten a first round bye in the postseason, but instead they had to host the Padres in the wild card round. It seemed like there were bad vibes raining down on the Mets this entire playoff series because fans felt like this series shouldn't even be happening. Apparently the players must have felt like that too because the 89 win Padres won two out of three games in City Field to stun the Mets and send them home early. This was a disappointing end to the year to say the least and one playoff win is certainly not what anyone expected including Steve Cohen, who following this elimination went on the single biggest spending spree in the history of Major League Baseball. Between extending Edwin Diaz and Brandon Nimmo and signing Justin Verlander, Kodai Sanga, Jose Quintana, Omar Narvaez, Adam Adovino, and David Robertson, Steve Cohen spent a total of over $491 million on the 2022 offseason alone. He also agreed to sign Carlos Correa for 12 years, $315 million before the deal fell through because of a failed physical. Which side note is maybe the biggest dodge bullet we've ever seen since Correa is batting a solid 193 this season. Even without Correa though, the other signings puts the Mets 2023 total payroll at over $346 million while no other team in the entire league is over $280 million. Also, because there are luxury tax rules in place, owners have to pay an extra 80% if they exceed a payroll over $290 million, which means Steve Cohen is spending roughly $522 million to field the Mets 2023 team. Now, this may be an unpopular opinion, but I believe Steve Cohen is the most overrated owner in baseball, I understand it's not my money and if he could afford to pay for it, it's not a big deal. But even then, while he's done a good job of bringing talent to New York, the Mets roster is by no means this all-star super team that we've seen from teams like the Dodgers in the past. So you're really just making a ton of inefficient signings with the I'm so rich it doesn't matter card always in your back pocket. But I'll tell you who it does matter for, the players. Because of the one word that we talked about at the beginning, expectations. When players are signing deals that pay them way more than they're worth in a city like New York, that is just a recipe for fans to get frustrated with their team when they don't play up to par. And expectations are one thing when you make some big signings, they're completely different when you have the highest payroll in MLB history by a lot, because then the fan base fully expects you to win a World Series, and maybe even multiple World Series. So when you play like the Mets are playing in 2023, fans get upset. Right now, the team is 19-20 and 20 and 4th place in the NL East. So far this year, they've only won 3 out of their 12 series, and they've been shut out a league leading 7 times. Most of the Mets team's stats right now are around league average, but again, considering the payroll and expectations, being around league average is basically like being at the bottom. So right now, as I make this video, there are two ways the Mets season could go, and these next 4.5 months will dictate which way it is. They follow the 2022 Braves, do what great teams do, learn from the slow start, play better, get into the postseason, and continue playing years of high-level competitive baseball, or follow the 2022 White Sox, who keep saying they have all the time in the world, don't actually do anything to fix the problems, and waste an entire season of not living up to the team's full potential, then have disinterested players who want to go elsewhere. In other words, the rest of the 2023 season will make or break the New York Mets franchise for the next 5-10 to 10 years. Because if they fail miserably, where do they go from here? You have the manager, the GM, the fans, and the talent. So does Steve Cohen just keep throwing more money at problems? What is there actually to change? There's too many unanswered questions that will only lead to more dysfunction with the franchise. But if you win, then that takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of everyone. Cohen can continue to do what he does with no questions asked, and free agents know that not only will the Mets pay them a lot, but they can actually win on the field as well. I personally think the Mets are too talented to not figure it out. I think they can still play postseason baseball this year, and it really just comes down to playing better. But which path do you think the Mets will go down? Let me know in the comments below. I'm always curious to see what you guys have to say. Like the video if you enjoyed, and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Thank you for watching, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next one.